And welcome to the Institute uh, for Human Ecology's second annual Constitution Day lecture. My name is Emmett McGrory, and I'm Research and Planning Director at the Institute for Human Ecology. Um, so the, the IHE is an interdisciplinary institute of the Catholic University of America. Um, our mission is to advance the understanding of the economic, cultural, and social conditions that are vital for human flourishing. And we do this uh, drawing on the Catholic intellectual tradition. Uh, we do this by educating students, uh, engaging in and sponsoring multidisciplinary research, advising policy makers and church leaders, and, um, and sponsoring symposia, conferences, and lectures such as the one we have today. This particular lecture is sponsored by our newest program, the St. John Henry Newman Undergraduate Program. Uh, that program forms communities of students to engage in social, spiritual, and intellectual events uh, in, in furtherance of developing cultured minds, deep in faith, and civic virtue. We are grateful to the Jack Miller Center for its generous support of today's lecture. Uh, the Jack Miller Center's um, mission is to support scholarship uh, in the teaching and study of the central ideas of, the, of American history and the broader traditions of Western civilization. Today's lecture, our second annual lecture on the Constitution, is being given by Mark Rienzi. Uh, a professor here at the Catholic University of America's Columbus School of Law. Professor Rienzi's research interests focus on the First and Fourteenth Amendments with an emphasis on free speech and the free exercise of religion. Professor Rienzi is also co-director of the law school's Center for Religious Freedom, and I might add that the other co-director is uh, my colleague at the Institute for Human Ecology, Bill Saunders. Professor Rienzi is also president of the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. Uh, there he has successfully represented a variety of parties before the Supreme Court. Uh, Professor Rienzi earned his JD from Harvard Law School and his Bachelor of Arts from Princeton, both of those with honors. And last but not least, Professor Rienzi has been voted Teacher of the Year three times by the Student Bar Association. So uh, with all that said, Professor Rienzi, uh, welcome. Thank you, Emmett, for that kind introduction. And thank you all for coming out to spend part of your day uh, to celebrate the Constitution. I'm honored to be here with you. As you heard from Emmett, I have a lot of jobs and a lot of bosses and a lot of clients. I seem to spend my life speaking on behalf of other people. Today, I have the somewhat rare pleasure of speaking entirely for myself. It's going to be fun. Although we know the document as the Constitution of the United States, I want to talk about it today as the Constitution for a divided country. Because our Constitution often does its best and most important work, not in how it deals with our unity, but in how it deals with our divisions and our disagreement. And I'm focused on division and disagreement because, let's be honest, we're living in very divided times. We have had recent presidents of both parties call disagreement with their policies not just wrong or misguided, but un-American and sick and despicable. We've seen the losing candidates in each of the last two presidential elections claim the elections were stolen or illegitimate without providing sufficient evidence to support the claim. We watched a summer of rioting, followed by the January 6th riot at the Capitol, followed by school board meetings about critical race theory and masking that often seem to be on the brink of riots. It is sometimes easy to look out at the country and see only division, see only blue and red, only us against them, uh, and only bad news. But I'm here today with some good news. We actually have a constitution that was written for a divided country. We have a constitution that aspires to form a more perfect union, not by silencing our disagreements, 
but by protecting our right to disagree and by channeling most of our disputes into a political process that offers a peaceful path for resolving our differences. I should note that deep disagreement is not new and is not inherently bad. Americans have long disagreed about all sorts of important questions, about race and sex and politics, about God and religion, about abortion and marriage, about war and peace. That we reach different answers about many of the big questions in life is actually a sign of health. It's a sign of freedom. In a diverse society, free people allowed to think for themselves will naturally come to different answers, even about the biggest and the most important questions of life. Of course, we could all imagine a world with much less freedom, right? a world in which the government dictated all the right answers, in which the government prescribes for you the one true religion, or the one correct scientific theory, or the one way of thinking that is permissible, and everyone's forced to fall in line and agree. I suppose we'd have a lot less tension and a lot less disagreement without all that freedom. But I don't think any of us really wants to live there. I sure don't. So our differences are the natural consequences of human diversity and human freedom. And if we don't want those differences to tear us apart, then the key question is, how do we learn to live with our differences in a free and democratic society? And on this subject, the Constitution that we celebrate today has much to say. But let me focus on just two aspects of how the Constitution tries to deal with the problem of deep disagreements. First and foremost, the Constitution sets up a government. It literally constitutes something. It puts it together. And one of the things that government is supposed to do is be a place to channel our disagreements into a peaceful process for resolving them. Madison talked about this when he talked about the problem of faction. He defined a faction as some common people united around some common impulse of passion or of interest adverse to the rights of other citizens. Today we might call them interest groups, and of course there are many of them, and many of them stand in deep disagreement with one another. You may recall that Madison said there are two ways to deal with these factions. We could either get rid of the causes or control the effects. But Madison quite rightly pointed out that you can't get rid of the cause, at least in a free society, because as he said, liberty is to faction as air is to fire. The reason we have disagreements is that we're free. So you can't get rid of the cause. Instead, you have to learn to control the effects. And Madison's argument for how we control the, the effects is you force them to compete in a political process, and particularly a political process spread across a large republic as Madison said, if you extend the sphere, you take in a greater variety of parties and interests who all have to fight it out in that peaceful democratic process. So one way the Constitution deals with our differences is by channeling them into a political process, right? And in that process, varying interests compete with one another, and even the losing side has the satisfaction of having been able to fight it out figuratively in the political sphere rather than literally someplace else. Second, although the Constitution channels most of our disputes into that political process, the Constitution does create some guardrails, some core liberties that it places beyond the reach of the ordinary political process. The best statement of this principle comes in the Supreme Court's decision in West, Virgi West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett. In Justice Jackson's opinion, he explains that the very purpose of a Bill of Rights was to withdraw certain subjects from the vicissitudes of political controversy and to place them beyond the reach of majorities and officials and to establish them as le legal principles to be applied by the courts. The point of the Bill of Rights is to take a set of rights and say those ones are not to go through the ordinary political process. Those are set aside from that ordinary political process so that no official can prescribe what should be orthodox. No official can tell you what you're supposed to think about politics or nationalism or religion. So if tomorrow Congress decides that it wants to establish a religion, or Congress decides that it wants to make all of us stand or kneel or sit during the national anthem, it can't. Why? Because the people, through the Constitution, took those things 
out of the ordinary democratic process and establish those as legal principles, guardrails, to be defended by the courts. But the Constitution leaves most of the rest of our disagreements to that political process, to the idea that the way civilized people who disagree with one another can sort out even deep disagreements is through the political process in which lots of interests will compete with one another, and even the losers will know they've had a fair chance to convince their fellow citizens and that they might be able to come back and change someone's mind another day. The Supreme Court sometimes helps and sometimes hinders this constitutional arrangement for dealing with our differences. Sometimes the court can get the Constitution grievously wrong and do things that exacerbate and stoke our divisions. One example of that is the 1940 decision in the first forced pledge case, Minersville School District versus Gobitis. There, Jehovah's Witness children refused to salute the flag. They thought it was a sin to do so, and they were standing in solidarity with their co-religionists who were being punished by Nazi Germany and having children taken away from their parents because they weren't loyal enough to the regime. And the Jehovah's Witnesses brought the suit when the government tried to force the children to pledge, to pledge allegiance, and the Jehovah's Witnesses won. They won in the trial court, and they won in the Court of Appeals. But then it got to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court got it all wrong. The Supreme Court said that if the local authorities think forcing children to pledge allegiance is a good way to get them to have nationalistic impulses, then who are we to stand in the way? We're not a school board. We don't know anything about educational psychology. They're the experts. We have no role to play here. Well, when the court said it had no role to play in protecting the religious minority, a lot of bad things happened. It set off a wave of violence. One author, Noah Feldman, up at Harvard, described it as people thought it was open season on the Jehovah's Witnesses. There was a wave of violence against the witnesses in their churches. Witnesses suffered beatings. Their churches were burned to the ground. Some of them were dragged out of homes and forced to salute the flag. Some of them were force marched out of town. Some of them were forced to drink castor oil, a torture straight out of Mussolini's playbook at the same time. One was castrated. Law enforcement officials often looked the other way, thinking they had the Supreme Court's blessing. One state deputy uh, told the reporter, quote, they're traitors, the Supreme Court says so. The ACLU called the violence against a religious minority, quote, unparalleled in America since the attacks on the Mormons. And if you don't know that chapter in our history, you should, that was a bad one. Eleanor Roosevelt complained, we must, must we really drag people out of their homes to force them to do something which is in opposition to their religion? By getting the Constitution so wrong, the court exacerbated our differences and stoked our divisions. Fortunately, the Gobitis era was short-lived. Just three years later, the court decided Barnett. Gobitis has ended up having uh, very little influence in most areas of the law. The one ironic exception is it still has a lingering uh, influence in the religious liberty sphere through a case called Smith, but that's a topic for another talk. Gobitis was a case in which the court got the Constitution wrong by failing to enforce the guardrails, failing to enforce the civil liberties that we the people had deliberately placed beyond the reach of ordinary politics. But sometimes the error runs the other way with the court stoking our divisions by pretending that the Constitution resolves deep questions that would otherwise be left to the political process to sort out. The leading example of this kind of error is the court's invention of a constitutional right to abortion. Nearly 50 years later, it is clear that the court's intervention has exacerbated our divisions over abortion. It has inflamed them rather than resolving them. In Roe versus Wade, the court said it couldn't quite figure out if human beings were alive in the womb. But the science was clear in 1973, and in fact had been clear for long before that, that humans are alive in the womb. In 1859, that's 1859, not 19, 1859, the American Medical Association called abortion, quote, the unwarrantable destruction of human life. And it said doubts about life in the womb were the product of exploded and mistaken medical dogmas. And shortly after that, in 1871, the New York Times, the New York Times, described abortion as, quote, thousands of human beings murdered before they see the light of this world. Now, my Catholic faith 
tells me that I should value and protect those innocent human beings. But it isn't God or the Bible that tells me they are alive. It's basic science and it's basic honesty. I was alive at that stage in my development. You were alive at that stage in your development. All the justices who decided Roe were alive at that stage of their development. Nevertheless, while the court professed ignorance on the question of whether humans are alive in the womb, it professed certainty that abortion is one of those issues that the Constitution has taken away from the people and given to the court to decide as a legal principle. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg once wrote that this, quote, heavy-handed judicial intervention was difficult to justify and appears to have provoked, not resolved, conflict. And Justice Ginsburg was right. Whatever one thinks of the merits of abortion, and as I assume you all know, Justice Ginsburg was in favor of legal and constitutionalized abortion. But whatever you think about abortion, it's clear that Roe and Casey have not resolved the abortion question. They've inflamed it. The deep social conflicts over abortion haven't gone away. They've just been prevented from playing out in the ordinary political process that we use to resolve most of our disputes. So they come out as displaced conflicts in other places. Ever wonder why there was so much political energy poured into making the Little Sisters of the Poor give out contraception? Right? It's not that it was difficult to get the drug to people. It's that people decided there's political juice in the issue and we need to have the fight someplace. And in particular, it was decided that it would be a good issue for the 2012 presidential election. Ever wonder why pro-lifers spend so much time on sidewalks outside of abortion clinics? Well, Roe and Casey said you can't resolve that issue in the legislative chamber, right? They sent the dispute to the sidewalks. If you compare that to how abortion is dealt with in Europe, you see a very different possibility. In Europe, abortion is one important issue, but it's not the dominating issue that it's become here. In Europe, the people actually work out the question of abortion democratically. And to be clear, I'm not endorsing the end result of Europe's approach, right? Uh, in Europe, as here, hundreds of thousands of human beings get killed by abortion every year. Uh, but there's no denying that the conflict is worse here. The violence is worse here, too. So the court's intervention in Roe and Casey was bad for the country. It's also been bad for the court. Our confirmations have turned into blood sport. Roe wrongly conditions people to think that the court is the body to decide our biggest and most vexing and fraught questions. Maintaining Roe and Casey forces the court periodically to lie to itself and to the public, as it would this term if it pretends that it's consulting the Constitution on the question of whether a 15-week abortion is different from a 22-week abortion. The Constitution doesn't say anything about that. And everybody knows when someone pretends, I'm gonna go look in the Constitution to find the answer, that they're really just figuring out what answer they think is right. The court diminishes itself and it diminishes the Constitution when it so publicly and transparently continues this charade. And this damages the constitutional approach to dealing with differences twice over. First, by removing the political process as a way to deal with our biggest and most important differences and work them out peacefully. And second, by undermining the court, by handing it a job and a responsibility that it was never meant to have. With all the divisions that we do have over abortion and other hot button issues, the court's role in enforcing the constitutional guardrails remains crucially important. Our very divided society needs a well-functioning court and a well-functioning First Amendment to protect the diversity of thought and belief that are the natural result of our freedoms. We need a well-functioning court to help keep us together as a country. And so here I'd like to turn to something the court has actually done quite well. Over the past decade, the Supreme Court has decided a series of religious liberty cases, touching on virtually every aspect of religious liberty law. These cases have concerned religious exercises by members of a wide range of religious faiths, Muslims, Lutherans, Evangelicals, Jews, Catholics, Hindus, Wiccans, among others. The cases have involved a wide variety of religious liberty claims, free exercise clause, establishment clause, civil rights laws. And they've involved a wide variety of factual contexts, schools, nursing homes, prisons, Abercrombie and Fitch stores, 
town meetings, war memorials, no-fly lists, synagogues, and more. In virtually all of them, the court has ruled in favor of the religious party or practice. Some counts say this is 18 out of 19 cases won at the Supreme Court. Arguably, it's even more if you include wins on the emergency docket. For example, some prisoners recently won stays of their execution to allow them to have the comfort of clergy, right? If the government's going to put somebody to death, at the very least, it ought to at least allow them the comfort of clergy. Um, and also, if you count additional wins on the emergency docket related to COVID shutdowns, it's more. I'm proud to say that my colleagues and I at the Beckett Fund have been involved in almost all of these cases and have registered wins for people of all different faiths and repeatedly won the votes of every justice on the court, no matter who appointed them. Scholars and critics of the court have offered a variety of theories about this religious liberty winning streak. Some have said that the court is simply trying to favor conservative Christian groups. Some have said the court is interpreting religious liberty to harm innocent third parties. Others have said the court is engaged in an unusual dialogue with the religious right to forge a new church state landscape that is bad for civil rights, especially for the rights of women, LGBTQ individuals, and people of color. These theories all fail to account for the sheer variety of different parties the court has ruled for. Many are women, many are non-Christian, many are racial minorities. And they fail to account for the often supermajority support, often unanimous support, for the, winnings, for the winning parties. That support has often included Justice Ginsburg and Justice Kagan and Justice Sotomayor and Justice Breyer. Justices who are unlikely co-conspirators in a new scheme to help conservative Christians and to trample on the rights of minorities. The much better explanation for the court's recent religious liberty decisions is that a broad cross-section of the court is quite serious about enforcing the bedrock constitutional and civil rights protections for religious freedom and religious pluralism. Even in a time of great division and even on hot button issues that are considered quite divisive. Let me give just two examples. First, an abortion case where religious speakers wanted to speak on the sidewalk called McCullen versus Coakley. That was decided in 2014. Prior to McCullen, pro-lifers had actually never won a speech case at the Supreme Court. Justice Kennedy, who was in favor of constitutionalized abortion, had pointed out that the court was warping more than half a century of free speech law to rule against the pro-lifers in those prior cases. But in McCullen, and in McCullen, the case was so controversial, this is a case about speakers who want to speak peacefully, not want to engage in violence, they just want to speak peacefully on a public sidewalk, yet the ACLU could not even file a brief on their behalf. The ACLU defends Nazis, but they couldn't defend the peaceful grandmother on the sidewalk. Yet despite all that, the Supreme Court decided the case nine nothing in favor of the speakers. And if you are a fan of choice, you should be a fan of the McCullen decision. Because what Eleanor McCullen's presence on the sidewalks does is it gives women a choice, an alternative to abortion. We know from studies that women don't have abortions because they think abortion's awesome, right? They have abortions because they think they have no place else to turn because their parents will kick them out of the house because the boyfriend will leave them because of all the other real world hard things that people go through. Eleanor McCullen being allowed to stand on the sidewalk offered people an alternative. And in her house, she has a beautiful refrigerator full of the pictures of the women and their babies who say that Eleanor McCullen being on the sidewalk was the best thing that ever happened to them. Massachusetts was trying to shut that down and nine Supreme Court justices, even on a hot button issue where you know they disagree with each other, came out and said it has to be protected. Last term in Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, nine justices again agreed on a civil rights issue. They agreed to defend the right of Catholic Charities of Philadelphia to conduct foster and adoption services consistent with its religious beliefs. All right, the Catholic Church in Philadelphia said they can work with people, but they can't do the home study where they go into someone's home, they study their family life, and they give an opinion to the government that this is a good place to raise kids. They can't do that for unmarried opposite sex couples because the church has beliefs about sex and marriage. And they also can't do it for same sex couples. 
Philadelphia without ever having a single gay couple complain. In other words, and this is something to be heartened about, before the Fulton case, there was actually not ever a single gay couple that went to the Catholic Church and said, hey, Catholic Church, come on into my home and give me your opinion on my family life. Um, to me, that's heartening because it shows that people can disagree with one another and still find ways to get along. There are 30 other agencies in Philadelphia. The gay couples don't really want the Catholic Church coming into their house to give an opinion on their family life. Again, it was a hot button case, right? Every big law firm or just about every big law firm filed on behalf of the city of Philadelphia. Google, Apple, Twitter, Facebook, you know, all the big tech controllers of the universe filed briefs as if, you know, they have important things to say about foster care. Um, and, and they all told the Supreme Court the right answer here is squelch the religious liberty, rule in favor of the city of Philadelphia's ability to kick out the Catholics from foster care. Nine justices held the line, right? They, all, they obviously don't all, dis, all agree on same-sex marriage. They don't all agree on much of anything. But they all agreed that the Catholic agency had to continue and that the foster parents who'd been working with them were allowed to keep fostering kids. And importantly, the nine justices, when they agreed, also said that Catholic Charities wasn't trying to impose its religious beliefs on anyone. And if you think about the critics of religious liberty, the opponents of religious liberty over the past decade, their favorite refrain is to say, well, you're just imposing your religious beliefs on somebody. Well, all nine justices said, no, they're not. They're just trying to stand aside. There's like 30 other agencies in Philadelphia. This is the government stamping out an agency that's caring for children. You should stop. So what's the Supreme Court doing here? Well, we live in illiberal times. And that means there have been new attacks on religious believers that need repelling. The Little Sisters of the Poor have served the elderly poor in this country for 150 years, and it wasn't until a few years ago that anyone happened on the idea that they might be an important cog in the contraceptive delivery machinery. Right? The Catholic Church was caring for foster kids in Philadelphia long before the city got involved, and no one thought to kick them out for their religious beliefs until a few years ago. So the court is just enforcing those Bill of Rights protections as described in Barnett and as is their job. But beyond enforcing the Bill of Rights to protect against these attacks, I think the justices are also trying to send us an important message about how do we live with difference and how do we live with disagreement. Broad majorities of the courts in these cases have recently explained how, quote, the religion clauses of the Constitution aim to foster a society in which people of all beliefs can live together harmoniously or in the Bostock case, where they said that the guarantee of free exercise lies at the heart of our pluralistic society. I think it's fair to look at the last decade of the court's religion cases and see the court trying to send a message, trying to lead on how we live with differences, right? Sharon L. Fulton being able to foster kids in Philadelphia actually doesn't stop a single gay person from doing it too. It just means that people are allowed to live out their religious beliefs without being punished by the government. The justices, all of them, I think, really do understand that an important part of how we live with differences is enforcing and respecting the First Amendment. So if you think our society is deeply divided now, just imagine how bad it would be if the court had decided these cases the other way. Imagine if the court had sanctioned the government punishing people, driving them out of the public square, stopping them from helping the less fortunate, the elderly, or the orphaned, just because they have the wrong beliefs, the quote unquote wrong beliefs about sex or marriage or life or politics. That would be pretty terrible. Imagine where we'd be if the justices had not said that religious groups rather than governments get to pick who teaches at religious schools. 10 years ago, there was a case where the Obama administration argued actually the government can override the school about who teaches. Nine justices rejected it. So think about that blue and red map that you see on election day, not the, not the state one, but the county by county one, right? Um, think about that map and think about what it would be like if the court had given those kinds of powers to kick people out for having the wrong ideas to every state, every county, every municipal government in the country. It wouldn't be a good thing. Thankfully, our constitution and our court's recent broad and unanimous willingness to enforce it, even in culture war cases, helps us live peacefully with divisions rather than having those divisions tear us apart. Of course, the Supreme Court can't do it alone, right? The court's ability to lead in this much needed way depends an awful lot on how we the people accept its rulings. 
So we need the court to be increasing its credibility by telling the truth about what the Constitution says, by fairly enforcing the guardrails that it actually provides, and by not supplanting the democratic process by which we are supposed to resolve our biggest differences. We need the court to help the Constitution do its job of holding us together despite our differences. And as citizens, we too have an important role. The First Amendment and Supreme Court cases will mean nothing in the end if the people develop a taste for authoritarianism and give up on their commitment to living peacefully amidst the disagreements that accompany our freedoms. Here, our own individual experiences in the political maelstrom of the last decade might help us all see the virtue in the First Amendment and in resisting the temptation to wield government power to crush opposing ideas and people. Because I bet each of us in this room can remember a time or two in the past few years when we've had a president or Congress with views that we think are evil, awful, and wrong, right? One lovely thing about the past decade is everybody hates somebody, right? Everybody, everybody looks up and sees some president who they think is unbelievably awful, and they can't believe that person's got power, and they can't stand the idea that that's the person who leads our country. Good, good, right? Think about it. As you think about that, and think about the one who you don't like, right? Think about the one you don't like, that should make you realize how much you do not want your government to have the power to punish you for having the wrong ideas, the wrong views on the deeply important questions, right? That's not a good thing. It's bad to imagine giving any government, even one you like, because eventually there'll be one you don't, the power to do those things. Our common experience with that division, whatever side of it we come from, should help us forge some unity in our desire for constitutional guardrails that protect the minority and a system in which most of our issues get decided through a political process. So our division should actually be, or can actually be, fuel for unity in our commitment to those constitutional principles. One last point. Please don't forget the personal. In these very divided times, it's an important duty of good citizens to actually try to listen to the opposing view. People who disagree with us about important and controversial things, religion, politics, vaccines, Trump, Black Lives Matter, whatever else we fight about, those who disagree with us are mostly good people. They're mostly honestly trying to do what they think is right in a complicated world. They are mostly not evil, not rubes, not racists, not anti-Catholic, not idiots. They just disagree with you. They, like us, are made in the image and likeness of a loving God. Honest and civil disagreement with them are great, but demonization and ostracism are beneath us. They are toxic to our humanity, to our individual humanity and to our collective humanity. In our individual actions and in our system of government, we should choose love and listening rather than hatred and silencing. If we can continue to do that, even in divisive times, then we can keep working toward that constitutional goal of forming a more perfect union. And it can be the best kind of union, one in which we all have the freedom to think for ourselves, and we also have the grace to work together in peace and friendship, even when we disagree. Thank you. Emmett, you're in charge. I don't know what I'm doing now. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for that speech of hope uh, about a document of hope. So I guess we'll have uh, Q&A right now. And I guess we should work that out. Um, well, do you want to just yeah. take them? Or? I'm fine, take them, sure. OK. Good one. Happy to take questions, but I also don't want to stand between you and the Chipotle. So it's a, it's a delicate balance, but happy to take questions. Bill? I've got a question. So uh, the First Amendment protects certain rights. Did we amend away the First Amendment? Sure. So we have an amendment process. Would that dissolve the union? It would be a bad thing. Um, would it dissolve the union? I don't, I mean, so the amendment process can amend any part of the Constitution. Um, there's one possible exception about the number of Senate, uh, state senators each state gets. 
Uh, but basically, the amendment process can amend any part of the Constitution. So sure, tomorrow we could decide we want to do away with free speech. Um, in practical terms, I do think that would be a pretty devastating thing to do to the union. So, uh, you know, but the closest we came is 35, 40 years ago, right? There was a push to amend the Constitution to allow uh, places to ban flag burning, to make burning the flag illegal. Um, thankfully, the court, uh, not the court, the people, didn't, the court had said you can't punish flag burning, and the people didn't go along with that amendment. I think that was a, a good thing. Even though I don't think burning the flag is a good thing. Yeah. I have a story of a visit from Furman University. I once heard Justice Hamill Gorsuch say that a student asked a question about his interest in natural law. And he responded by saying, My interest in natural law is no more relevant to how I rule as a judge. I think he's right. I think he's right. Um, so, you know, I, I believe in natural law, too, um, but I don't think it's in the Constitution. I think we agreed to certain things as a matter of positive law in the Constitution, and I think it's a bad and dangerous thing to authorize the justices to consult their own individual views of what the natural law is, because frankly, they disagree, right? Justice Gorsuch surely has a different view of the natural law than his former boss, Justice Kennedy, had, right? Um, so I think it's a good thing. I think legislators should consult it. I think it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to think about. It's an important thing to think about. It's part of why I think killing babies in the womb is wrong, right? Um, but I don't think the natural law is written into the Constitution or that the justices are authorized to override the views of the people on it. Sir. So, with your capital faith in mind, do you think anyone, if you were presented, I mean, I said it with your uh, if you were presented with a case that was constitu that constitutional, the Constitution supported a ruling where it would contradict your faith, but do you think a judge could in good conscience make that judgment? So um, I'm not a judge. That's good. Um, that's why I can speak much more freely than other people. Um, Justice Scalia wrote about this quite a, lit, quite a bit. Justice Barrett wrote about it um, you know, years before she was a judge. Um, so I think serious Catholics on the court have kind of done a lot of thinking about where those lines are, like what are they that it's one thing to not stop something from happening and it's another to affirmatively do it, right? So if the law says capital punishment, right? I think just, this is Justice Scalia's view. If the law says capital punishment's okay, he's able to just look at stuff and decide, yes, this meets the standard or not the standard and he's not personally implicated in it. Um, all that said, I think judges have an awesome, and I mean that like, you know, in the, not in the cool awesome, but in the awesome. <laughs> They have an awesome responsibility um, on their shoulders when they deal with sentencing, right? Like sending a human being to live in a cage for years. That's a, that's, that's a weighty thing to do. Um, deciding the Constitution, all these big questions. So I think these things are hard. Um, I think for most of the serious Catholics on the court that I've heard talk about it, what they would say is that their faith you know, requires them to be honest, requires them to live up to the oath to uh, apply the Constitution that, therefore, that they're there to apply. And it doesn't tell them that they should override what the people have said. And they don't think that they have a, a religious obligation to do that. Um, that said, again, I go back to my first point, which is I'm not a judge. Mm -hmm. Sir. Um, when considering an issue like abortion, right, uh, what's the alternative in that if it's not being decided by the court, obviously the democratic process and the legislative case process would occur. But is that something that you envision as being of a federal democratic process or more of a statewide issue? I mean, historically, the justices have talked about it mostly as a state issue. And at the federal level, you have to get over the, over the hump of finding a congressional power that reaches it. Since they tend to interpret the Commerce Clause very broadly, it wouldn't blow my mind if someone says abortion is commerce. I mean, people pay for them, so maybe. Um, you know, so maybe it's interstate commerce. But generally, it's been the kind of thing that's been handled at the state level, and I assume that would be the, the first place you'd start to see it play out. And I think you'd get different answers in different places. And to be clear, I'm not at all sure it would lower the abortion rate. It may not. Um, but I don't think the Constitution actually creates a right to abortion. I think that's invented. And it was invented, if you read the opinions, it's invented by the court saying, we're here to tamp down on the controversy. And like the ironic but true 
fact is it didn't tamp down on the controversy. It lit the controversy on fire by telling people you can't go work it out someplace else. You got to wait till one of us dies. Right. And so then why do people why do people fight over Supreme Court appointments like it's World War Three? In part because the Supreme Court years ago told us it's World War Three. And so people treat it that way. Right. That's why they can be so much better for the court and the country if they would just tell the truth, which is Constitution just does not create a right to abortion. And it was a mistake when we said so. And now we're going to fix it. I think that would be a whole lot better for the court in the country. Sir. Yeah. Um, when talking about free exercise of religious liberty, often the question of the common good is brought in as a check to exercise that that we right that we have and the famous case of, of smoking peyote being illegal and a religious justification doesn't you know authorize that as legal or something like that. My question is, how do we understand the common good if we are so deeply polarized and in point, point apart, like if pluralism is part of what makes us Americans that we do disagree and that disagreement is a good thing, um, could one argue that we, we can't have a conception of the common good because we disagree and today, given that we disagree, how, how can we think about the common good? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, first, uh, just to be clear, I, the peyote case is wrong, right? Just so in case there's anything. <laughs> Justice Scalia, phenomenal judge in lots of ways, but wrong about the peyote case. Um, the peyote case is actually just a descendant of that Govitis case I mentioned before, um, right? Uh, most of the time, here's the, here's the answer most of the time, really like almost all the time. In a big country, with a massive government, with the alphabet soup of agencies that have their hands in things, um, it is almost never the case that the government really needs to force someone to violate his or her religion, right? So most of the time, we don't have to come to a common agreement that this guy smoking peyote in the woods is good, right? Like, I, I don't expect, and I don't think the Constitution requires people to agree on that. All it requires is us to say, well, since the Constitution does protect free exercise of religion, the government shouldn't override it unless it's got a very strong reason. And most of the time, the answer is the government can get things done. It's like the one blessing of a massive government is they can do anything they want, right? So think about the Little Sisters. Some people may think contraception is awesome. Some people may think contraception is terrible, right? Okay, fine. But if you're the federal government, you really want to get it to people, how hard is it to come up with a way that doesn't involve nuns? It's just not that hard, right? It's just really not that hard. We put mail in people's mailboxes every day. We can put men on the moon. We get, we get little pills to people if we want to, right? Like, we don't need nuns. So most of the time, the common good question, you don't really need to get agreement, contraception good, contraception bad. It's enough if we just say religious liberty and pluralism good, and therefore we shouldn't kick somebody out, right? We shouldn't crush them unless we have a very, very good reason and need to do it. So if your religious belief is human sacrifice, you lose. You should lose, right? If your religious belief is driving the wrong way on the beltway, you lose. You should lose, right? But that's not most religious beliefs. Most religious beliefs aren't harmful like that, and we can coexist just fine with them, and it's a bedrock basic idea built into the country that we do it, even when we don't all agree. You know, child sacrifice is easy. We all agree that the common good is don't let them kill the kid, right? But, but even when we don't, there's a lot of ways to get it done short of needing full agreement on that. There's somebody in the back on that side before? Do you have a hand up? Yeah. Yeah, um, so obviously, um, we're in a pandemic, right? Um, so there's talks about vaccine mandates. Um, and the Biden administration has said they want to mandate uh, vaccines. Uh, Justice Barrett said in a case that was brought to the Supreme Court, uh, that as long as there's religious exemptions, there's really no need to discuss a uh, Supreme Court case in regards to vaccine mandates. Do you think uh, freedom of religion is under threat by the proposed vaccine mandates under the Biden administration? Yeah, so the Barrett ruling, I may be wrong about this, but I understood what you said to be like the public explanation that people figured out that they think Barrett means as opposed to something she said. In other words, I, I may have missed. Did you read an opinion by her saying that? Yeah, I, I may have missed it. I thought she just denied the petition because there was a religious exemption in it. Yeah, um, and she didn't really explain, right? So um, look, I think on vaccine mandates, historically, vaccine mandates have come with religious exemptions. The one that the Biden administration is doing in the military comes with religious exemptions. The one that the Biden administration has said it wants to impose on employers with more than 100 employees 
comes with the ability to test out of it once a week. And I don't think that even overrides Title VII, which requires religious accommodations. So ultimately, I think we actually have a long history of working this out and we've tended to work it out with religious exemptions. It'd be a little bit weird if this vaccine needs to be treated different from the way we treated polio and, and things like that. Um, so my suspicion is in the end, it'll be done with religious exemptions because that's the way they've been doing it in places. Uh, but I don't know, right? One caveat everyone's got to give about life these days is, you know, it's been a wild ride for the past decade, right? You don't, you don't really know, sir. Uh, yeah, I have a quick question. This is more of a hypothetical, but um, in regards to the abortion case, there's been, you know, none of the justices have accepted, but John Finish wrote an article a couple months ago saying that abortion itself was unconstitutional in the 14th Amendment. And that view was obviously not gone very far, but others have supported it. But if that were the case, would you be opposed to it if you would? You did. What would you say to people that are in favor of it, since you are, you know, a pro so what would you say to them when they would say, it doesn't matter the reason, is if we get rid of something we consider to be evil or wrong, isn't that a good thing? Yeah, so one, I mean, so Finnis's re reasoning, and there's also a, a student named, not student, he was a student of mine years ago. He's now a practicing lawyer and a talented scholar, Josh Craddock is somebody else who's who's argued this theory. It's relatively new and it's not, none of the parties in the Dobbs case are arguing it. So um, it's a relatively new theory. It's interesting, right? One of the things Craddock found that I didn't know about is, you know, so the question is, well, was a fetus a person in 1868, right? When, when we passed the 14th Amendment and we said, all persons get the equal protection of the laws, would people have understood that they were protecting human beings in the womb? Craddock has done some fascinating research showing that the abortion prohibitions in state codes throughout the country at the time, right? Almost all states banned abortion at the time, which is part of why it's ridiculous to pretend, you know, Roe creates a constitutional right the other way through the 14th Amendment. Um, but almost all the states that did it had it listed as an offense against the person, right? Um, and talked about the unborn baby as alive. Um, and again, those, those quotes I was giving you, the AMA and the New York Times, that's people in the 1800s talking about it, right? Like we went through a period a little, you know, maybe when you guys were babies when I was a, a teenager, um, you know, it was common to pretend we didn't know, right? Like, like when I was in middle school and high school, people were like, ah, oh, but you don't really know, you know. And, and the truth is like human beings have known it for a long time. Um, and that's, that's a smoke screen, right? So it's fascinating to think, what did people know in 1868? And could you make the argument? There's no chance of the court biting on it now. Um, what I would tell people who say, even if it's wrong, do the wrong thing anyway, because it leads to a right. Uh, I don't know. That's, no one's asked me for that advice, so I haven't really figured it out. I do think ending abortion is a good thing. And I, I'm op open to this argument. Again, it's new. I haven't, um, I haven't dug into it. I don't think it hasn't really been through the academic ringer yet. But there's certainly some, some interesting pieces to it. Yes, in the back. Uh, yeah, so I was wondering about, like, um, I guess with the recent, like, nomination of um, the Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett, a lot of, um, I guess there has been a lot of pushback from the left on, um, you know, the idea that, like, you know, she was nominated and a lot of talk has they think happened about, like, packing the courts, like, and increasing the amount yep. of Supreme Court seats, and then I recently just, like, read an article like a super text the Supreme Court's legitimacy, a Supreme Court justice should step down. And I think a lot of it I think has to do with like I think the fact that she was confirmed so close to the end of Trump's um, presidency. And I think there was also an issue I think a few years back when Justice Scalia died near the end of Obama's presidency that she wasn't able to um, raise his um Supreme Court nomination. So I, I guess what, are your, what you made of that? Yeah, you know, so one of the interesting things is there's kind of no avoiding some level of politics with the Supreme Court, right? Because they get nominated by presidents and they get confirmed by senates and elections have consequences, right? And so, you know, to get something passed, you kind of need the president and the senate to be willing to work together. And that's a political question, right? And so sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, sometimes they hold off, sometimes they like the nominee. Right. Um, you know, a lot of really good nominees were rejected over time, too. Right. So um, ultimately, that is political and you kind of can't help it being political. Um, it's a criticism people can make of the court. But boy, if if the if the remedy for this is to say, go pack the Supreme Court and, and change the numbers. I mean, that's to me, that's just an obvious downhill slide. You know, everything we get out of a benefit of having a Supreme Court goes out the window if you say, okay, well, whoever's got control is just gonna add seven more, 
right? Like the one thing I like about these nine nothing decisions is they kind of send the signal, look, this is just the answer. And so don't think you're going to change a couple of justices and get there. But if the answer is, well, Congress will just add 10 new justices, like we could go down that path, but I think we would destroy the Supreme Court. And I think the nation gets a lot of benefit out of the Supreme Court. And frankly, right now, and this flip flops over time, but right now the energy on that is from the left. Um, I, boy, I would argue over the last century, the court has been more a friend than a foe to advancing causes of the left. And so if I was on the left, which I'm not, but if I was, I'd be pretty wary of blowing the thing up. You know, I'd think long and hard before I blow it up because I think, boy, I've gotten a lot done at that court and blowing it up may not be such a good thing for the causes I wanna, I wanna further. Yeah. Professor, I'm just curious in your thoughts on um, Um, so that's going to be the big fight, right? So they just announced December 1st is the argument in Dobbs. That's going to be the big fight, right? Is, well, do we have to respect the precedent? I'm pretty sure five or six of them think it's wrong. Um, again, like, you know, Ginsburg at times sounded like she thought Roe at least was wrong. She, she thought she could justify it on some other ground, but she didn't think the reasoning in Roe was very good. Um, so I think the question is going to be, do we overturn a precedent? Um, to me, I think the answer is, look, if it's a constitutional precedent and you know you got it wrong, particularly if it's had awful consequences, which I think it, it has, um, I think the answer is you have to fix it, right? And I always think back to Brown v. Board, right? Imagine if in Brown v. Board, the court had said, well, on one hand, we've got the Equal Protection Clause. It says everyone gets the equal protection of the law, so therefore you can't treat people differently based on skin color. But 60 years ago, the Supreme Court decided Plessy, and we said that separate but equal is okay, so now we're stuck. You know, I think they take an oath to, the con to support the Constitution, not what previous people who wore the robes think about it. And so, you know, I think they should be careful about overturning precedents, but I think we've got a big one on a constitutional issue where it really has not held up well, where it has stoked division. Um, I think the obligation really is to do the right thing and just say, look, we got that one wrong. It's not, you know, again, it, it would just send abortion to the people and the people would vote for it. And I'm not sure you'd have any fewer of them, but you'd have the court in a better space, and you wouldn't have everybody looking to the court. And I think this is important. This gets to why, why were people so upset about Barrett replacing Ginsburg, right? It's because they're used to staring at the court saying, well, these are the nine people who are gonna decide everything that matters in life. It would be good to condition people to stop thinking that way. Like that's actually not healthy for our political system. And so I think, you know, getting rid of Rowan Casey would be a good, good thing to do there. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's your opinion on uh, some groups that try to abuse uh, religious liberties on um, like, like there are a lot of satanic temples that in reality are just a bunch of atheists who want to get out, get, get in and annoy Christians and things of that nature. What are your opinions on them? Is there becoming a bit more vague? Yeah, so I think religious liberty protections protect sincere religious objections, right? And I, you know, I've never had any problem and I've always been fine with the idea of courts testing sincerity. Courts test sincerity all the time, right? Two people are fighting over what color the traffic light was. Courts look at them and they figure out which one do I think is sincere. Like you can you can figure out if someone sincerely holds a belief. Courts do that every day. Um, so religious liberty protections apply to people who are sincerely religious. As you say, I think there's an awful lot of people who aren't sincerely religious but are trying to use religious liberty anyway. You know, um, courts tend to see through that. Like this this happens a lot. You know, it doesn't happen a lot in cases like Hobby Lobby and Little Sisters and things like that. Why? Well, because those are places where someone is choosing not to provide something that's popular and that would make them some money, right? So pharmacist says, I can't give out plan B. You don't really need to test sincerity. Why? Because look, the guy's losing money, right? If he was willing to sell the thing, he'd make the money. Um, draft objections, people sometimes fake. In prison, people sometimes fake their religious exemptions to get their religious beliefs to get better treatment. Right? There's one case where someone said they're, they're part of a new church and their religious sacrament was uh, Chateaubriand and good wine once a week. <laughs> Guess what? The court said, you know what? I don't really believe you. Um, and and so, so courts can see through that stuff. And I suspect if they litigated the cases, courts would see through those folks too. To answer the final question, the Chipotle is right out there. Thanks very much. <laughs> I was just guessing that was the that was good. Question. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, once again, thank you to the Jack Miller Center. And just a real quick announcement um, for you undergraduate students. The IHE uh, has two student-driven reading groups this semester one on anti-totalitarianism and one on art and modernity. 
So please see us afterwards if you're interested in either of those. Thank you very much.